get rid of my gum real quick. Okay, everybody. So we are back in action. Uh, every time I do one of these videos where I think I'm going to answer a bunch of questions for somebody, I end up with a whole bunch more questions around the outside someone else is asking me. So what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to talk about and try to illustrate the delay that happens between when the device that's turning the injector on tells it to turn on and when it actually gets open and starts flowing fuel. And then the delay on the other end where we tell it, hey, close, and uh, the injector doesn't actually close. Now, this is something I was very curious about, and it's kind of interesting. Like, my thought process runs in circles, right? So this is something that I did, well, once again, I thought a couple years ago. When I open the file, turns out it's 2015. But anyway, in my mind a couple years ago, um, where I had put the injectors on when I started building the flow bench and watching what the injectors were doing I couldn't understand the data that I was getting out of them. It didn't make sense uh, So I thought I need a way to understand how the injector Opens like I, I need a way to to actually know when it's opened after you've commanded it on I mean I can see on the flow bench that I command a certain duty cycle or a certain pulse width let's say and I don't get any flow. And then as I increase the pulse width, all of a sudden flow starts. But from the time where I tell it go until the time where it actually gets open, how can I measure that? It's almost like, you know, the injectors make noise when they click on, on and off. You can hear them pulse. Uh, and so I thought, fuck, I need, I need a way to get like a microphone or something and somehow measure the output of the microphone or whatever. Well, I didn't have a microphone laying around. And I thought, you know what? It acts like a microphone is a knock sensor. And I happen to have a knock sensor. So what I ended up doing was taking a knock sensor and putting a C-clamp and clamping the knock sensor to the side of the housing of the injector and then putting the injector trigger and the output from the knock sensor into a lab scope so that I could watch the signal from the knock sensor when the injector valve opened against its seat, I'd be able to see hopefully something in the data trace that would make sense. So I did all that stuff and I have the data traces for us to look at. But I thought before I went there, I would just do a little bit of an illustration about the delay or the latency or the dead time or um, the time that exists from when the injector is commanded to open to when it's commanded to close. So for this demonstration, I've got my, um, my trusty partner in crime, also known as Papa Tech. Uh, so Papa Tech is going to be the injector, and the scenario is this. That door over there that goes into our shop is uh, the injector valve, if you can imagine, and the fuel is going to flow through that injector valve, and it's going to flow out of that open office door. Now, can you open the door up real quick, Dad? You, you can imagine that the fuel would be coming from there and coming towards me, just kind of like airflow is coming through here right now, and it's blowing air from the back of the shop out through that open door in the front. So because there is a flow happening, and because he has to open the door when he wants to, against the airflow, it's a little bit harder to open it than it is to close, because obviously when he goes to close it, the air blowing through the office will try to slam the door shut on its own, right? So you can imagine if we had 100 PSI of fuel pressure in the shop pushing against the door, it would be really hard for him to open it against that pressure that's trying to hold it closed, and that's effectively what's going on in the injector, right? So now I'm going to play ECU, and Dad is going to play injector. And so this is just demonstrating the delay between when the, when the ECU says open and when the actual injector can open. And it's as simple as this. Open. Close. There's a delay there, obviously, between when I say open and when the door is actually wide open and when it actually closes. Open. Close. Now I can actually do a peek and hold. Open. Close open, close open, close open, close open, close open, close open, because he can't close and open fast enough. So that's kind of the demonstration of the hold cycle of the injector. All right, thanks, Dad. I appreciate that. So that is hopefully just a very simple uh, explanation of the delay that you have between when the command comes on from the ECU to open and when the injector can actually open. And if you'll pardon the pun, uh, I have just done a live demonstration on the injector dad time but um tush 
tip your waitress, I'll be here all week. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some actual data traces from an actual injector. This was a billet atomizer 700 uh, EFI fuel injector on the flow bench. I've actually got a tripod to try to keep from making everyone sick at home, at least due to my shaky videography skills. Okay, so um, what you're looking at here are three different traces. Um, and I'm gonna, this is a PicoScope capture. Uh, and I think I in, kind of talked about this a little bit in the introduction where I was trying to work out what was going on with the injector, how to measure what it actually physically opens from when it's commanded. And uh, so the, the traces that we see here in the three different colors, let me grab this pen, we have this, this green trace. In fact, I think I'm gonna back up a few steps to make this a little bit more simplified. Get rid of some of those pulses. Okay, there we go. All right, so this red trace is amperage going into the injector. It's time for me to close the door because Papa Tech forgot to close the last time I told him to close. Okay, back to the uh, traces on the screen. With the, the red trace is amperage. It's current going into the winding of the injector as it builds and then kind of has this funny hump in there that I never could work out what that was. And uh, this green trace here represents the voltage signal to the injector. So if you want, this is where the injector gets commanded to open. This is me yelling to my dad to open the door. And this is where the ECU grounds the injector. And so the voltage on the injector trigger wire drops to zero. And then this is where it releases the ground and we get an inductive spike in voltage that flies way up off the screen. And then it slowly settles back down to battery voltage again until the next time it's time to open the injector over here. Okay, so the, the red trace again is the current going to the injector winding. The green trace is the voltage on the trigger wire for the injector. And the blue trace, this is our knock sensor. So this worked beautifully. I, I couldn't believe how well it worked once I'd looked at the data. So what we have is uh, uh, this, this ringing is the noise that the knock sensor picked up here when the injector valve actually opened. Right, and then it, it's gonna make noise and ring like a tuning fork would. So you hear it ring, 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 and eventually dissipate. And over here, we have the closing side where the valve goes closed. Now, once I had the knock sensor signal on here, I could then start to understand what I was looking at with this kink right here in this trace and this weird bit of voltage swing here. Because if I line my cursors up, I'm not sure how well you can see the cursors, but, I'll illustrate them with a pen anyway. Um, the injector gets commanded on here. The current in the winding rises up, right? The injector valve at some point starts to move and then gets wide open right at this point because you can heat see the noise in the knock sensor trace when it hits wide open. And then the current continues to rise afterwards until the controller turns the output back off. The current goes to zero. The magnetic field in the injector collapses and induces a high voltage on the trigger wire, which ultimately rings and goes back to battery voltage. Meanwhile, we have this other trace in the knock sensor signal that shows us when the injector valve slams back closed. Um, so by having the, these two patterns here, it became obvious that there's a relationship to the shape of this curve and the injector closing and the shape of this amperage curve and the injector opening uh, that makes some sense. So in other words, all I'm just saying is that it became obvious what those humps had something to do with the injector opening and closing. So what happens is that the injector, when we start trying to open it, um, it's, it's got to open against fuel pressure. The fuel pressure is holding it closed. Uh, and as the current starts to ramp up, eventually the energy in the injector overcomes what's holding it closed and it begins to move. And as the injector valve itself starts to open, it actually generates voltage uh, in the winding of the injector. Again, this, this is not meant as a technical uh, video to describe the uh, physics of how uh, an injector works and electromotive force, but take my word for it, when the injector moves, uh, because of the fact that the metal or the metal part of the injector pintle that's moving inside the core of the winding uh, is moving, it is reducing or in, it, is, it is opposing the flow of current through the winding. And that's why the current bends over right here as the injector begins to move. 
And then at the point where the injector actually stops moving and slams open, the current is then, because the, the valve of the injector is no longer moving, it's no longer pushing back or resisting and the current flow is able to increase, right? And it rings on up here to whatever this is, eight amps, and then turns off either because we have a pulse width that's short enough to tell it to turn off or because the injector drive is going into what's called peak and hold mode. It's going to its hold mode from peak. Okay, so the thing to notice about this is, uh, number one, I was absolutely shocked at the delay time from where I command the injector to open here in green to where the injector actually opens fully onto its valve seat, which would be here where that kink is and where the ring is from the knock sensor. That represents 2.76 milliseconds. So this pulse width that's being delivered to the injector is from this point where it's commanded on until it's released is 3.68. So we have what, 2.76 was it? At 2.77, 2.76 milliseconds worth of that time is the injector not moving, well, it's not moving full fuel at least. It's moving some fuel because at some point it begins to open and the flow of the injector will start to go up until the valve is wide open here. But between where, we, where the ECU expects that the injector instantaneously goes wide open and instantaneously closes, we have this delay of 2.7 milliseconds. We're asking for whatever, three and a quarter milliseconds, we're, we're 2.7 of it is used up before we even get the injector wide open. So this delay, if you think about the implication of this delay, it means that from the point where you command your injector on to where it actually starts to spray can be many, many, many degrees, depending on how fast the engine is turning, uh, later than you expect it to be. But you might say, oh, wait a minute, Shane, on the closing side, there is a delay to closing as well. So let's see what that is. All right, let's move the cursors over. So let's go over here to the point in the voltage trace where we have the kink down, where we know the injector valve has stopped moving closed. And we have a, a pattern in the knock sensor trace to tell us that. And we'll move the other cursor over to where we've commanded the injector to turn off. And that's right here where the voltage inductive spike goes up, right? So that represents 1.56 milliseconds of additional time that the injector is flowing. Maybe not fully because it's closing at that point, but it is flowing. So the real difference in the amount of fuel that you get out of the injector for a given pulse width is going to end up being the difference between what you command and, and the time that the actual injector is open for. So in this case, because we gain back some of our time on the closing side of what we lost on the opening side, you can subtract away the closing side delay from the opening side delay. In this case, 1.56 milliseconds on the closing side. On the opening side, let's go back over, 2.75. So that's roughly, what, one and a quarter? Yeah, it's one and a quarter milliseconds. So we have a dead time of 1.25 milliseconds on this injector at this fuel pressure, at this battery voltage, specifically to this injector. Not every injector. Every injector is going to be different, and all those variables will change it. But we know we have a commanded time difference between what we've asked for and what we actually received. Let's, let's see what that ends up being if we were to go open to close time. The ECU thinks it's going to deliver 3.7 milliseconds worth of fuel because that's when it turns on and where it turns off. But over on the actual injector opening and closing side, the injector is wide open here and the injector is wide closed here. That's 2.46 milliseconds. So it's got 2.46 milliseconds worth of fuel when it expects that it's got which again, I gotta keep measuring it because I don't have enough brain power to remember what this is, 3.6. So those numbers kind of jive up. The difference between what it takes delay to open and what it takes delay to close when you get the extra fuel back and the difference between when the valve's wide open and when it's closed versus the commanded and expected instantaneously open and instantaneously closed time that the ECU is delivering. So this all points back towards the um, battery voltage uh, compensation or the offset of the injector and the dead time.
But this just takes it a step further because you can actually see what's going on with the injector itself um, by using the lab scope and you know looking at these current voltage and particularly the um, the trace from the knock sensor, which can give us a clue as to when it actually is happening that the valve gets wide open. Now, here's another thing that happens. Um, at, it, during this test, I ran from zero duty all the way to 100% duty. So I'm gonna back up the screen traces here, and right now I'm going backwards, so I'm going down in pulse width. Now, knowing what we now know about this kink here that happens and the knock sensor trace, what do you think is going on when we deliver a pulse width that we don't get that kink from, right? The injector can't possibly be wide open, and we see that the injector starts to make some kind of noise over here, but this could also be the injector opens, doesn't get to the wide open stop, and goes back closed again, right? And so we get some limited amount of fuel flow here, and we haven't got the injector wide open because we haven't waited long enough for the current to make the valve open all the way. We know that that takes about, what, I think it was like two and three quarter milliseconds or something like that. Let's just see what we've got here from the point where we turn on to turn off. Okay, we're 2.46. Well, that's less than the 2.76 that we know it takes to get the injector to go wide open. So in this case, the injector, you know, if it's supposed to go that far to wide open, it goes some portion of that and goes back closed again. So therefore, you don't get a full dose of fuel. And this describes that lower non-linear operating range of the injector where uh, the, it doesn't follow the line that the injector creates uh, at the slow or small end of the pulse width curve because you haven't gotten the injector wide open. It's just some amount open and goes back closed again. And then as you increase pulse width, it'll eventually, the pulse width will be wide enough for it to get all the way to the open stop and go back closed. But in between wide open and closed, you're getting some smaller variable amount of of opening and therefore variable amount of flow, which is again why you have that lower nonlinear operating range on the injector. Okay, now check out what happens when you go to the other end of the spectrum. Um, and as we increase pulse width here, watch what happens. Okay, so this is the the other thing is I don't know that I described the peak and hold when I was telling my dad open close open close super fast, and he was unable to close the door uh, and open it as fast as I could tell him to turn it open and close it. Uh, I was demonstrating a, a control method called peak and hold, or in that case, it would be hold. Hold is represented here by the voltage trace in green and this little bit of a current wiggle and the reduction in the total current in the circuit when it goes to hold mode. Uh, so by switching the injector on and off at a super high frequency, the injector valve itself actually can't respond and go closed it effectively stays open, but the current in the circuit is reduced. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, you don't want to overheat the injector and get it hot or the injector driver. So your circuit, you don't want to overheat by just letting it draw endlessly at eight amps while that injector is open. The other thing is that the recovery time, the time that it takes for the injector to close, changes with the amount of current that's in the circuit. So we can illustrate that because we have this Nice knock sensor trace, and it might be easier for me to zoom back out full scale here, and we'll just do a real quick test. I'm gonna put the cursor over here at where we know the knock sensor rings when the valve closes and we get that kink in the voltage curve. And I'm gonna put this cursor where the injector is turned off, which will be where you get the inductive ring back at this side where the voltage goes high on the green voltage trace. So this is 1.379 milliseconds. Now, somebody remember that so we can go back to that in a minute. 1.379. Let's go back over here where we don't have a hold circuit. We're switching from full current at 8 amps all the way off. And let's see if that delay time is the same. So here is the command to go off. And here is where the valve actually gets closed, right? So this is the command to go off. But the, the circuit has 8 amps in it. Right? And this is, the, this is where the valve actually runs into the closed seat. And you can see the ring and the knock sensor trace here. And that's 1.546. Now, the other one was 1.37, I think. So you can see that as you reduce the current in the circuit, it takes less time for the injector valve to get closed. And that's why it's important if you're trying to control the injector in the best possible way 
to use the least amount of current it takes to make the injector stay wide open at the pressure you're trying to run. The more current you leave in the circuit, the more apt you are to not be able to get the injector valve closed when you start opening and closing it fast, i.e. high RPM. So let's have a look at what happens as we go up in duty cycle and start running out of time for the injector to close all the way. So we're just stretching the pulse width out here, running a fixed frequency, uh, and the pulse is getting longer. But you'll notice what's going on. The injector is being commanded open here. It's being told to close, right? The valve actually gets closed here. And right here, we start asking it to open again. And at some point, these two are going to overlap each other. And look what's going to happen. Eventually, the on, the opening ring from the knock sensor, is starting to absorb the closing ring from the valve. So we're starting to limit the amount of time we're giving the injector to get closed. And it's not, it's not going it, to, at some point here, these two are going to cross. It's not going to be able to close anymore. It'll just stay wide open. So I'm going to go up and there. We've already eclipsed it at that point. Not what that pulse width is. But what we effectively have here is one little ringy where we've turned the injector off here, right? I'll use the, the pen. So this is where we've commanded the injector off, but we've immediately asked it to start opening here again, right? And you get this little bitty wiggle in the knock trace only because the injector valve goes for just an instant from wide open. It starts to close and goes slams back open again. And so that's what this little noisy trace here in the knock, knock pattern is. Um, and notice the difference in the shape now of the current trace. Remember that kink we used to have where the injector valve would uh, slam into its open stop and we'd have a kink there and then the current would take off? Now the current trace is just a nice smooth shape, almost looks like an ignition coil, right? Because the valve is not moving anymore. It's just barely going closed and slamming right back open. So we don't have a pronounced kink and we don't have a pronounced like a uh, pattern in the in the trace of the valve closing because it's effectively not closing. It's just maybe, you know, like rattling a little bit. And that's what we get here. And we don't have that pronounced kink in the current trace anymore because we've now got the injector to the point where we're asking it to open so quickly that just like the peak and hold doesn't affect how the injector can, it can't respond fast enough. We're now commanding it on and off fast enough or often enough that it can't get back closed again. So it's effectively wide open and or what you would maybe call or refer to as static flow. So I'll back up here again. So a few things to take from this. Number one thing, if you're stupid like me and you don't know the right way to measure something, but you have some stuff laying around like old knock sensors and old whatever, it behooves you to try something instead of assuming it's not going to work. Uh, and uh, maybe you might learn something. In this case, it worked beautifully. I can't believe how well it worked. And we were so well, I can't wait to go do it again. I forgot that it's been seven years since I've done it or six years since I've done it last time. And now I'm interested to go try it again now that I have a little bit more knowledge than I had seven years ago. Um, but the, 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 other, the other part of it is, uh, you know, sticking the scope on the thing, you can actually kind of see what the injector is trying to do. And, you, and it suddenly becomes understandable what all these wiggles and, and humps are that you see in these traces. Uh, and you can, you can have an idea of what uh, the injector is and or requires by using the lab scope uh, and measuring what happens when you turn it on and off. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this is, again, the delay, right? The delay from where we ask the injector to open to where it actually opens. And let's just check that. Now that we're at a different um, duty cycle than where we measured before, we're going to find out that the opening delay is always the same, which is not surprising. Uh, 2.8 milliseconds. I think we're at 2.76, so that's going to be based on where I put these cursors. It's effectively the same amount of time um, from when we ask it to open until when it gets open. Uh, and that doesn't really matter what the pulse width is. That's really more about the char characteristic of the injector itself. And you can also think about the implications of what happens if you were to run, say, the wrong peak and hold settings on this injector. The amount of time this takes from here to there on this specific injector at this pressure and this battery voltage is this amount of time, 2.8 milliseconds. If we have a peak and hold driver that's a canned peak and hold driver that peaks at 4 amps and goes straight to 1 amp hold, as soon as we reach 4 amps, which I get the amperage cursor over here at 4 amps, so we've got a crosshair, right? So that's over here, right? So you can see if you run 4 amps peak and immediately go to hold, that injector is not wide open yet. 
I'm not even sure it'll get wide open at that point. It may, but it might be multiple more milliseconds before it actually gets wide open and starts flowing. So the peak and hold drive settings should be tuned to match the injector you're trying to run. You, you can't just use a common peak and hold setting for everything, unless of course you don't mind running too much current through the injector, in which case you can run you know, maximum settings on everything. And uh, the, the worst case scenario is that the injector will open like you expect, but you'll have so much current in the winding, you'll create extra heat, potentially fail your ECU and your uh, injector sooner, and or uh, you will go to a static flow condition sooner because the injector with more current in it can't close as quickly. Uh, so yeah, there's the, uh, there was one other delay I was thinking about. I guess, I don't think I have enough brain power to come up with whatever it was. We went over this time delay, that time delay. Uh, we have the delay between the two. I guess there wasn't much else to talk about. This is really, um, you know, it's enlightening if you've been working with this stuff for a long time. It might be a little bit enter entertaining or interesting if you've never seen it before. But it, it definitely will open your eyes a little bit. Um, and particularly if you think about how it pertains to timing of the injector. If you have a system where you are synchronous, so the injector outputs um, fire only at a specific time during the cycle, and you are commanding a specific time when the injector should either open or close, you have to understand that your injector will have a delay or a latency in it from when it is commanded open until it actually starts flowing that will completely affect that timing number. And that means that unless this is known, uh, you're not going to be able to calculate what the injection timing ought to be. You're probably just going to have to go move it all over the place until you find what the engine wants, which is what you should do anyway. But it would be a lot faster if you could start out knowing what the delay of the injector was so that you could kind of get yourself in the ballpark or at least get in the right zip code um, before you start trying to make your adjustments. So anyway, that was a lot of information. It was a long way to go. This is a long-winded post uh, and or video. Hopefully it was uh, something that's useful uh, and you guys enjoy it. Um, and I guess if you didn't, well, then I wasted a bunch of my time. But it, it helps me to try to explain this stuff because I don't think you really can grasp, at least for me, I don't think I can really grasp the concept of how something works until I can explain it to someone else and, and in a way that lets them understand. And so if you understood the video, let me know. Um, as always, thanks for watching and thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and on YouTube, and I will try to put this on YouTube, uh, at Tuned by Shane T. You can uh, follow me on Facebook, Shane Tecklenburg, or Tuned by Shane T. I'm already at 5,000 friends, and I just have to throw somebody off in order to put somebody else on. So unfortunately, if you send me a friend request and I don't, uh, and I don't uh, respond, that would be why. But anyway, that's the, uh, the long and the short of the crazy experiment of putting a knock sensor on the side of an injector. And hey, the other nice thing is we now know what the knock frequency of a fuel injector is. So if we ever need to do knock control on a fuel injector, we have that figured out. Uh, no, that's bullshit. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm signing off from beautiful downtown, lovely Huntington Beach, California. Thank you very much. Good day.